Funding for the production of Folks is provided in part by the Friends of LPB. The roles of blacks in medicine have come a long way, but there's still a great distance to travel. Hello, everyone. I'm Rob Hinton. And I'm Genevieve Stewart. Today on Folks, a fascinating look at some physicians, past and present, and an update on the current status of Flint Goodrich Hospital, one of this country's oldest black hospitals. That and more today on Folks. Everybody says folks. Today on Folks, we'll be focusing on black doctors. There was a time when black doctors had to struggle to increase the faith of other blacks in their professional abilities. But times have changed, and black physicians have traveled a great distance. A lot of that progress can be attributed to the early efforts of black pioneers in medicine. We begin with Dr. Ulysses Grant Daly, who was born in Donaldsonville. He was a very prominent surgeon who studied in London, Paris, and Vienna. He set up his own hospital in Chicago, and at one time was a surgical assistant to the famous black surgeon, Dr. Daniel Hale Williams, founder of Provident Hospital in Chicago. There's Dr. Charles Drew, well known for his research in blood plasma. During the mid-30s, he taught pathology at Howard University. During World War II, Dr. Drew was appointed director of the American Red Cross Blood Donor Project. He later became chief surgeon of Freedman's Hospital in Washington, D.C. Dr. William Hinton was one of the world's authorities on venereal disease. He is responsible for the development of what is called the Hinton test, a reliable method for detecting syphilis. Dr. Percy Julian helped create derivative drugs which are widely used today by sufferers of arthritis. He taught at Fisk and Howard Universities and in 1935 successfully synthesized a drug used today in the treatment of glaucoma. There's Dr. T.K. Lawless, who was born in Thibodeau, once one of the leading skin specialists in this country. He also made valuable contributions to the scientific treatment of syphilis and leprosy. Dr. Rivers Frederick, he was born in Point Capee Parish and received his early education in New Orleans. Dr. Frederick graduated from Strait College, one of the schools that merged to form Dillard University. He studied medicine at the University of Illinois, but he spent most of his years practicing in New Orleans at Flint Goodrich Hospital, where in 1932 he was appointed chief of surgery. Then there's Dr. Ernest Cherie of New Orleans. He practiced medicine for 51 years and also served on the staff of Flint Goodrich. He was a founder and vice president of People's Insurance Company, established during the Depression to help indigent patients pay their health care costs. Dr. Cherie received certificates from several presidents of the United States for health care delivery and his work in the insurance field. He was also the first black radiologist in Louisiana. Dr. Leo Stanley Butler was known as the Dean of Black Physicians in East Baton Rouge Parish. He received his training at Howard University and did his internship at Freedman's Hospital in Washington, D.C. In 1962, the National Medical Association cited Dr. Butler as the General Practitioner of the Year. He played an active role in the community and spent more than 50 years caring and healing the sick. This community center is named for him in the neighborhood where he lived and practiced medicine. Today, there are approximately 12,000 black doctors in this country. Now, that might sound like a lot, but actually, that's a little more than 2% of the total number of doctors. Here in Louisiana, black doctors have fought long and hard to reach their present status. And a lot of the thanks can be attributed to the Louisiana Medical Association. Dr. Thomas, what exactly is the Louisiana Medical Association? 
Well, the Louisiana Medical Association is the counterpart in the black community that was formed years ago to carry out the same persons, the same uh, purposes as the white organization when we weren't able to join it. They were interested in the problems that address the health of the uh, black community. Well, we were interested in the whole community, but our vested interest was in the black community. And also, we were interested in continued medical education and keeping up with the latest facts and findings in the field, and also with public health problems and also with economic problems that were peculiar to our particular group. Now, what is the focus of the association today? Well, the focus remains the same. However, most of us belong to both sides of it. Most of us belong to both the black and white local organizations as well as the state and the national organizations. But there are still peculiar problems to our community that we addressed. We are sure that we see a lot more Medicaid, Medicare patients. We see a lot more high-risk patients. And uh, there are public health problems involved. Uh, the very nature of poverty is a lot of them are that we have to address that perhaps is not a, as big a problem in the other community. We hear a lot about the shortage of black doctors today. Exactly what is the picture like here in Louisiana? Well, I think that, generally speaking, that uh, the, there is still a shortage of black doctors. There are uh, increasing numbers of black doctors coming out of medical schools because of the open policy now, as well as the past subsidization of people who were previously unable to go. However, I think that we still have a shortage in the black communities. I think part of the problem, however, is in distribution, and part of it is in the specialties that uh, we certainly woefully need uh, more primary physicians or family practice doctors. We are putting out more and more specialists. Uh, here in New Orleans, at one time, there were less than 18 black doctors, and we thought for one time that we were like the vanishing American. But now we have over $150, uh, 50 doctors in medical practice here in the city of New Orleans, which is a tremendous increase. Why do you feel the shortage exists? Well, uh, as I said, I think some of it is a matter of distribution that we're putting out more and more specialists, and most of the specialists change, uh, are trained in met metropolitan areas around hospitals and they make their uh, connections there and they are familiar with friends and others in the community so they stay there but uh, in the rural areas uh, throughout the state of Louisiana and I suppose throughout the nation there are a lot of, of communities where uh, you have no black doctors at all and probably very few white doctors as well. Okay. Tell us what the LMA is d here in Louisiana is doing to reduce that shortage. In our present program uh, is one of the things that we do plan to address. We are trying to encourage uh, doctors who are in training here in the city hospitals, in Cherry Hospital and other hospitals in New Orleans to go to rural communities. And also, I think that the MMA has a program to try to encourage them. Plus, uh, in uh, many of them who are being subsidized have to pay back their uh, obligations to the government by serving in public health in areas where they are high risk or where there are few physicians, which also aids in the distribution of the adequate care of people where they are underserviced. How closely do you work with med schools like Tulane and LSU as, as far as uh, recruiting minority students? We try to assist them in minority recruitment by pointing out uh, people who are interested in medicine and who want to go there and direct them to the program. Also, we participate in the program itself by having uh, medical students and also college students who are interested in practicing medicine to come in and visit with us in our day-to-day -day practice of medicine to see what it's all about, to come into the hospital, to observe operations, to work in the paramedical services and the lab laboratories and x-rays to get them interested in it and to uh, try to uh, persuade them or uh, help them to overcome any obstacle that they may have. We haven't done it in the past, but one of the things that uh, in this administration we hope to do is to try to establish scholarships also to aid people who have been suffered from the Reagan administration and uh, cutting up funds from this area to encourage uh, black uh, youngsters to go into medicine.
over the last 10 to 15 years, we have seen a dramatic increase in the number of black doctors here in the New Orleans area. What do you attribute that increase to? Well, I think it's because uh, of uh, the subsidization uh, that uh, it's an expensive proposition and that uh, because scholarships have been available and that loans were available that they could pay off when they got into practice has, has made a tremendous difference. I think the image that the doctors before them, to see doctors come in the community who are specialists and who can do the same thing that the white doctors have been doing years that we heretofore have not been able to do. I think things like the establishment of just this clinic here has been an inspiration to a lot of us. Uh, also, uh, we have tried to uh, encourage doctors to come to New Orleans, especially in specialty areas, by hiring them and subsidizing them until they're able to build up a practice that's large enough to go on their own, so to speak. Tell us what you think it's going to take to get black doctors in other areas like Lake Charles and Lafayette. I, I, I don't know whether it's a good thing to say, and I don't know whether it's true of all doctors, but I think that everybody who spends as much time as doctors have to spend in training feel like that when they come out they need to be uh, adequately supported. And a lot of them uh, have the wrong concept, as I see it, that if they go into these communities that they won't be able to make the type of living that they would. The other thing is the matter of uh, facilities. In many instances, in these outward areas, either they do not have hospitals or they have closed staffs or staffs that are difficult to get into so that by being in the specialties, as most of them are, that they don't have what they need in the way of equipment and hospitals to justify that going into it. I think even the attitude of the community is a fact also. I'm not saying that this is true, but uh, in many instances, uh, the doctors who go into the community, they have to be accepted by the community and helped economically and otherwise uh, to make it attractive enough for them to want to take the risk that is involved in the rural practice. Do you think young black doctors today are more concerned about the dollar than they are quality health care? Well, I think they are interested in both. I think they are well trained. They, most of them come out uh, having had uh, the required surgery or other uh, medical training that is necessary for that particular field to pass boards. So they feel like that they are able to offer a high quality of service and of course you get what you pay for and they feel like that they can get what their services were, then they should not make the sacrifice that they should go somewhere where people are able to pay and it's a little easier for them to establish themselves and in the rural community. Are black doctors today still having trouble getting hospital staff positions? I don't think it's as difficult to get hospital positions today as it is to uh, play a major role, an important role. Now, it's true in the city of New Orleans that uh, there are major tremendous strides. I don't think there's hardly a hospital in the city of New Orleans that does not have a black doctor on it. I think perhaps some of the reasons why they only are for devious reasons. I mean, uh, to get uh, funds, to have projects, uh, and get grants, one of the things that they require is that you are an integrated staff, so some of them are on for that reason. I think they are, in some instances, they are sincere but I think that their chances of advancement, such as becoming president of the staff, or of uh, having uh, standing high on the list when it comes to uh, admission of patients, uh, the scheduling of operations, I think sometimes that we do find prejudice. And this is not true in all hospitals. I know there are white hospitals where they have black chiefs of staff. They have. Uh, white hospitals where black physicians serve on the board of uh, the governing board of the hospital and in many instances they do receive a fair uh, a share of what's going on but uh, generally speaking I would say that uh, they are not uh, as favorably placed on the staff as they would if they were in a predominantly black or more liberal atmosphere clinic. Are there any other problems that the more established black doctors face today? I, um, some, some, there are some other things that they experience other than this. I mean, uh, usually the, the barriers that are placed are not all professional. I mean, you have social barriers, you have economic barriers. Uh, I think one instance of this is in the attempt of black doctors to obtain Flint Goodrich Hospital 
uh, we hear advertised on the radio that the Iberia Bank, uh, well, I don't know whether I should mention the name of the bank or not, but uh, uh, lends millions of dollars to individuals, and yet we had 50 doctors, and I'm sure some of them have assets well over a million dollars to sign a note for the bank to buy uh, two or three million dollars to buy from Goodrich Hospital but nowhere in the black community, uh, or the white community, or the black community, could we find the funds, even with this kind of endorsement, which means to me that uh, certainly I think if we'd been a white group, we wouldn't have had this barrier. So we meet uh, both professional and economic barriers. Are medical schools like Meharry and Howard still good places for blacks who are interested in medicine to go and study? I think that they are, and I, I think it, that perhaps in many instances they are better because uh, many doctors who reach uh, the postgraduate level are not as well prepared as they should be on the basis of their inferior education before they reach that level. And they're more likely to find uh, help that can bring them up to par in a black school than perhaps they would in a white school where they would just be another number. I think they have something like a buddy system at Howard where everybody who comes into the freshman class has an upperclassman who sort of tutors them and guides them along the way. Uh, but uh, there are many who go to white schools that experience no difficulty, that meet the standards, and we find more and more black students going to white uh, schools and coming out and doing great work in the community and making a name for themselves. And what about black hospitals like Flint Goodridge? Are they still a good place to practice? Well, I think so, and uh, of course this probably has been one of my biggest disappointments. Uh, those of us who were here earlier and uh, lived with a, a, a poor hospital, at that time we were part of Delhi University at Ben Goodrich, uh, felt like that if we could just hold on until the black doctors, young black doctors came out, that they would have their boards and their training. They could come over and make the policies for the hospital. They could develop the areas. But not only here in Flint, at Flint, but throughout the country, we find that most of the black doctors who come in the community, they're not particularly interested in, in black hospitals. They're interested in the prestigious, prestigious hospitals. They want to go where they have the best equipment. They can go where they'll be best known for what they can do. And uh, this is, I guess, an easier way out and perhaps a way of making more money. But uh, I think that if the black doctors who come out would come to the predominant black hospitals, would establish the policies and procedures and stick there and cooperate with the hospital, that they would have a much better advantage than they do by going in the white hospitals where they have to start at the lower end of the totem pole and work up with tremendous odds against them. When the Greek philosopher Hippocrates wrote the Hippocratic Oath for Physicians, he surely assumed that forever and always doctors would be men. Well, situations have certainly changed dramatically during the last 3,000 years. There are currently 3,500 black female practicing physicians in this country. And some projections indicate that black women will one day represent numbers approaching half the practicing black physicians in the United States. We can definitely say that the male-dominated role in health care is changing. Dr. Stella Jones is an obstetrician-gynecologist in her fourth year of private practice in New Orleans. Dr. Jones came from Houston for her specialty training at Charity Hospital. She became enamored with Louisiana culture and never left. Dr. Jones explained that racist and sexist obstacles she encountered actually led to her career in medicine. Black women being in medical school at the time that I finished pharmacy school was not popular. I don't even know that I could have gotten in at that time. So um, I uh, went to pharmacy school, and basically because of one of the Martin Luther King movements in Atlanta, I was recruited as the first black pharmacist at uh, Grady Memorial Hospital in Atlanta. I stayed there until it was time to, say, select a, a senior pharmacist, and as it turned out, uh, the reason that I was not put up for the job is because I was not old enough, but I think it was I was too black. So I became very disgruntled, and I left, and I came back to Houston. Um, I worked at the hospital as a staff pharmacist f 
until I had my second child. And at that time, I just, you know, felt a basic unrest. So I went back to school at University of Texas, and I got a master's in public health. And I was going to start working on a doctorate in public health, and I said, well, this is going to take me three years. Why should I do this? So I applied to medical school, and I thought that I had everything against me, but as it turned out, I had everything working for me. Dr. Jones, which among your personality traits makes you a good doctor? Well, I think especially with being in obstetrics and gynecology and dealing with the patient population that I have, I would say that about right now, 50% of my patient population is what we would consider, quote, unquote, the private patient. And about 50% of the patients are, are EDS or Medicaid recipients. They get no more or no less than the private patient. As a matter of fact, sometimes I find myself giving them more. And I have had people, I've had my colleagues ask me, why do you give them so much? And I tell my patients, I give you more because I expect more of you. And that's what you get back. When you give them so much, you get more back in return. You teach them, and you can see your teaching. You know, it all comes out. I think when you spend time with them, it can make the difference between a young girl you see today having one baby, going back into school, going on to be at least a good homemaker, a good mother, than having somebody come back to you next year, the year after that, the year after that, and finally, you get a chance to spend some time with her. She's a 20-year-old mother with five kids, nowhere to turn, no one to talk to. You give of yourself early, and you find that not happening consistently, time after time after time again. You open yourself up. You know, you give them somebody to talk to, somebody to call, and they'll call. Raised in a family of meager means, Dr. Jones is one of seven children who are all executives or professionals. She attributes her success to encouraging parents and her supportive family and friends. In order to be successful, it's, it's not you alone. You have to surround yourself, with, surround yourself with good people. I have a dynamic husband, a husband who gives me all the kinds of support that I need, we have to first of all start with him. Uh, my children are understanding. They're very understanding. You know, because in order for me to be a successful physician, I have to give up something sometimes, somewhere. And you can't imagine how many times they have to say, Mom, are you coming to the program today? And I have to say, I'm sorry, I have to go to a delivery or, I'm sorry, I have surgery already planned, but eventually we make it up. I have a wonderful housekeeper, and I have a dynamic office staff. And it takes all of those things working together to ultimately make you successful. It's a sort of interdependency. In spite of the tremendous demands on her time, Dr. Jones is a member of Jack and Jill of America, which promotes parenting skills and cultural programs for children. She is a member of the civically involved Suburban Arts Guild, and she serves on the board of directors of the Children's Bureau. Occasionally, she finds time for painting, interior decorating, and the piano. How do you manage with four children, a successful husband, a very busy practice, where is the real Stella Jones among all of those roles? I have a little philosophy, and it's sort of like time, a life. You take a square, divide it into four parts. Um, we all want to be very pleasing and very appealing, first of all, to parents, because we have that segment to satisfy. We will always be somebody's daughter. I try to be the excellent wife when I have to, and that is where the missus part comes in. And then the segment for the patients and the children is sort of interdivided, that one-fourth for them. But then, as tiny as it may seem, 
that one fourth that I have left is for me. I know titles, no last name, um, just first name, just Stella. And that time I take to be me. I do what I want to do in that time. In discussing with Dr. Jones what the future holds for her personally, her response was concern for her patients. If I had my way and um, I could uh, wave a little magic wand, I would wish that all my teenagers who are pregnant now or who have been could reach out and touch and see that they could do. That's what I would like. If I could see that in the future, that would be very pleasing to me. In considering the role of women in medicine, one must include Dr. Anna Cherie Epps. She is an assistant dean and professor of medicine at Tulane University's medical school. Although she was refused entrance to medical school because of racial and sexual bias, she prevailed with a Ph.D. and numerous medical fellowships, including Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Epps is responsible for recruiting and educating 178 minority doctors, with another 100 currently enrolled. The National Medical Association awarded her its Scroll of Merit as a scholar and educator. Last year at this time, we told you about this hospital where we are today, Flint Goodrich in New Orleans. It was in the midst of a lot of controversy. We thought it only fitting that we bring you an update at this time. Flint Goodrich Hospital has been serving the New Orleans community for more than 88 years. Before integration, it was the premier hospital for blacks in the South. For many years, Flint Goodrich was owned by Dillard University. That was until last March when the hospital was purchased by National Medical Enterprises, a large medical chain. Dr. Thomas, with whom we spoke to earlier, is also medical director at Flint Goodrich. Well, I think it still has great possibilities. Uh, I think that it, it has been bought by a hospital chain, National Medical Enterprises, that is able to furnish the necessary equipment and staffing. And I think that with the prop support that it has a very bright and brilliant future. But, uh, I mean, I guess you'd have to be a prophet to to be certain, but I think it has a very good opportunity in the community to become a first class and hospital and to attract black and white doctors and to offer a tremendous and peculiar service to this community. NME is investing more than one and a half million dollars into the hospital. Money to be spent towards renovations, expansion of services, purchase of equipment, and staff development. A start, says Dr. Thomas, but not nearly enough. I think it's going to take a, a, a lot more money and a lot more um, equipment and personnel to bring it up to what I'd like to see it be. But uh, my experience in the past, and uh, I guess even now, is that uh, money is not something. You can't buy everything with money. I mean, you need motivation. You need people who are dedicated. You need a dedicated staff. You need cooperation among people, and you need organization to make the thing work. And this is something that money does not always buy. And I think the management and anything and uh, staffing and service are the things that are going to make it a first-class hospital. That's our program for this week. Thanks for watching. Next week, another program saluting Black History Month. Until then, make it a good week. Everybody's just folks. Just plain old folks. Funding for the production of folks is provided in part by the Friends of LPB.